All right. Well, thank you for having me. Um, glad to have an audience that is this large here at school. Um, today, I'm going to talk about aggressive PHP QA. Uh, if you don't know me, um, I'm. Um, whoa, what happened to the slides? Okay. I'm Marco, I'm this guy on the internet. If you see that avatar I run, I have this reputation of being the bad guy in code reviews. It's true, I am the bad guy. Um, and I'm trying to fix it, so um, I'm kinda gonna show you what I mean by that. I'm a consultant, work for a company called Rove. What do consultants do? They come to your company, take the money, and then they go to conferences. <laughs> Has been working fantastic so far. Now, back in the day, I did a talk called Extremely Defensive PHP. Extremely Defensive PHP was a very good talk, I think. It still applies to most of what I do, and I would still endorse you to see it if you haven't. And that talk is mostly about best practices. Now, best practices exist. Don't let you, anybody tell you that they do not exist, but they change over time. So maybe your grandfather or your grand-grandfather thought that smoking a cigarette when waking up was healthy, and good for the morning, that's no longer true. Okay, so they change over time. And that talk was from 2014. So a lot has changed since then. A lot still holds true. So software quality assurance um, is about setting standards and trying to enforce them and keep them over time. If you go to Wikipedia, you read a bunch of garbage about ISO this and ISO that that nobody really understands and you need three years of certification in which you then say, what am I doing with my life? Um, but effectively, why quality standards seems a bit redundant. So now, who's the developer here? It's basically everyone. You understand this. I hope you understand this. When you join a new place, new workplace, you usually get in this situation where there's a lot of people running around trying to fix things instead of focusing on trying to get it right and they're too busy to fix it because they're landed in this loop, which maybe if I fix my slides, okay, cool. I'm good at, don't do your slides with React, uh, React JS, it's a bad idea. Um, you have deadlines, deadlines have to be respected, then the developers do a hasty work, then the hasty work gets to production, and then in production everything crashes, so you're firefighting all the time. You're constantly fighting the downtime, the bugs, and so on. So you have no time to improve, and there you go again. And this is in a loop, and it continues on and on. I've worked, I think, in now at least 10 companies where this is true. You keep working and you keep wasting time effectively. Now, it is very much known that it takes more time to fix stuff once it reaches production. In this case, this is for changes in general. So if you discuss a change very early in the process of introducing a new feature, a new functionality, then it's really cheap to fix and adapt the system to it because you did not write anything yet. As soon as you get to production, the cost of changing this is massive. Look at Doctrine, we can't change anything. It was a bad idea up front, by the way. So the best way is to keep the process in such a way that you get most defects at the very, very beginning of developing something. So you try to either pair programming, mob programming, um, you can get reviews there, you can discuss with stakeholders on location before writing the code. Um, but this graph already shows us that even just having traditional system testing on the right, which means you got your code out and somebody's gonna test it for you, does not work. We already got so much time wasted. That, and we got so much time distance between when the feature goes live and when the feature was developed, that you work on something and the next week it goes live and you have no idea what it was, so you already forgot. I have no idea what I coded yesterday, I forget stuff. And then maybe you develop something on Friday and it gets deployed on Monday, and in the middle you had so much booze that it doesn't make sense anyway. So, to make it clear, what is QA not? QA is not people. The role of the QA person that goes in and tests whatever you wrote manually is bullshit. It's a garbage job that nobody really wants to do, and it's really, really bad 
for making interpersonal relations because basically they hate you for everything they do. You know, everyone in QA hates dev and everyone in dev hates QA. So it's not really making friends. It should not be a manual and repetitive task because the repetitive stuff is what we're good at. We're good at destroying jobs by making them rep uh, the repetition go away, but at least we're destroying jobs that are otherwise extremely you know, dehumanizing. And surely it's not someone else's problem. If you don't know what a SAP is, a SAP is a TLA. What is a TLA is a three-letter acronym. All right, it's not someone else's problem. As a developer, you need to step up and make sure that what comes out of your coding system or your development environment is already qualitative enough because the developer knows exactly how the system works, knows how to avoid all the traps, so you develop with, you know exactly how to jump over that form that you develop, you know exactly what to avoid, what to not test, you know exactly which mock data is going to be used, and then somebody else tries the system out and everything crashes and burns. There is another movement which is about observability, which is about squishing this time between development and production and trying to keep it as small as possible. So you try to develop in quick iterations, you push to production as much as possible because you get feedback loop from the system already. Um, and this stuff is old. This is from a, a, a paper from 1996. And effectively, this paper, I have no idea how it, if it holds true still, but it says that it costs 640 times to fix something that got to production, that got deployed. Now, I don't know if that's true anymore. I don't know how the paper is still actual because this was in a pre or kind of like internet infancy era, but it says a lot. So traditional software testing is dead. If you see somebody doing traditional software testing, fix that. It's bullshit. That's not a good job. QA should be doing exploratory testing and they should be contributing to the automation that developers build in testing a system. Even somebody clicking together a Selenium test suite is better than somebody doing a manual job, okay? Now back to who is a developer. The idea is that all of you should be owning your QA process. In order to do that, there's a lot to be done but you can start. I mean, if you don't do QA this way yet, talk to your boss because this talk is for you. So first of all, where are we starting from? To QA, to know if your system is respecting quality standards, you need to know what the system is doing and what it's supposed to do. So my first suggestion is that requirements should be owned by the team developing the system as much as the stakeholders. So there are a few techniques that are very good for this. First of all, BDD, which is about distilling requirements and trying to extract them from what you discover during development of the system. There's obviously DDD. Uh, talk is not about these. I'm just mentioning them, right? If you don't know them, go at least glance at them. Uh, DDD is about mostly talking to business and extracting information from business and trying to understand what they mean. The words they use may not be the words that you understand immediately. And effectively, you keep emerging the specification, you distill it, and then you come out with a document that looks like this. Well, this is my preference at least, and this is part of your repository, your project. And this is a language called Gherkin, which is a very, very simplified version of English. If you're writing something for legal specifications in the French environment, then you may write in French, that's okay. But effectively, you have some language that describes what the system is supposed to do. You have it as part of your project, not somewhere a 60 pages PDF document that says what the system is supposed to do, and everyone is gonna tell you, but at page 25, chapter 3.2.74, you have this clause and you did not continue, you did not implement it correctly. So that's what usually happens. No, take this, this is testable too. Won't tell you how, but you can test it. The second thing you need in order to kinda own your QA and be sure that your system works as expected is owning your architecture. The architecture is effectively the important stuff, according to Martin Fowler. 
um, but it's also a non-functional requirement. We're all sitting in this room, nobody's really caring about how the cables work inside the walls. But, you know, it would be a problem if this room was not holding as it is, yeah? It would be a bit worrying. In order to um, keep the architecture of your project and own it, there is a very simple way to document and discuss this approach, which is through an ADR. An ADR is an architecture decision record. Sounds complicated is really, really easy. As a team, you take, and whenever you take an architectural decision, you commit a file that looks very much like a git commit, and this says what was decided, who decided it, or who signed off on it, what is the status, because you can say this is something we no longer do, so you can deprecate stuff. Um, why are we doing it, what are we doing, and what are the consequences? Writing it this, in this way forces you to take your master plan of using a microservice architecture and write why you're doing it, instead of just I saw it at a conference, okay? If you have to write it down, it's already half the job in trying to understand why you're using it. The idea is that you discuss architectural decisions, you make them your own, and you enforce them over time. This ensures quality, architectural quality over time. If you don't have this, what happens in a project is that over the years, 20 per people try to work on the project and you see exactly that the code looks completely different from section to section in the project. And it's completely impossible to understand whether the quality of the code or whether the system is doing what it's expected to do. The next step is obviously automation. So now we documented what the system is supposed to do. The next thing to do is automating everything. This means CI. I don't really care about CI as in, is it a master branch? Are you pushing to master and stuff like that? No, I consider CI as a very simple loop. Is everything good? Yeah, okay. Otherwise exit with one and it's red. And if it's red, it can't go to production. That's really all there is according to what I understand as CI. And in PHP, we have a lot of tooling, thanks to the community. And these tools are required because PHP is a horrible language. PHP is arguably terrible. I know we're all here for PHP, and I got a career out of PHP, but I would argue that I should not have a career thanks to PHP. I should have a better language that doesn't need an expert to tell you what to do with the language. Right? If you had a better language, you wouldn't need an expert to tell you what's good and what's wrong. Uh, so in PHP, you need experience. Experience is king. The more experience you accumulate, the more you know what's good, what's bad in the language. And what is good about the language and its community is that we have a lot of tools. And these tools are experience accumulated by other people that worked on the language and that introduced those decisions. This is good and this is bad. Put them in the tool and now the tool is kind of able to tell you what's good and what's wrong. Now, in order to make this work, I strongly endorse using a monorepo. Do not have 20 repositories for one project because effectively you're gonna repeat the entire CI setup for everything otherwise. Have it once, you know, it's easier. Even if you have one project with subdirectories and every directory is its own PHP project, that's still easier and having 20 projects and 20 CI setups and whatever, and then everything fails independently. Could be good, but I suggest Monorepo, it's easier. Um, one tool that I really like is from the Sensualize people in Cologne and in, uh, um, in Berlin, and they work on this thing called DevTrack. This is mostly managed by Simon Mönch. DevTrack is a simple tool, I would say, that categorizes your code and tells you which component can use which component. So you configure it with, ah, I broke my slides again. Okay. You configure it with YAML, which causes me mild anger, but that's okay. I can survive this. You tell it where the sources are, and then you tell it how to categorize those sources. Now I took a simplistic example, but you can drill it 
out in, uh, in more detailed architectural decisions. So you categorize things and you say, things that are called controller are in the category called controller, things that are called repository go in category repository, but you can also define your own collectors, so you don't need to use names, you can use interfaces and stuff like that. And then you define rules, ooh, rules that effectively tell you that a controller can rely on a service, and a service can rely on a repository, but the repository cannot use anything else. And then you run this tool on your code base, and it will find violations. Now, I obviously took this from the readme. I'm not going to tell you how to set up all these tools. But effectively, it's going to tell you, look, the repository uses the controller somewhere. This is a violation. Exit code one, you put it in CI. You already know that some arguably either bad intended or well intended change introduced something that is an architectural issue. Static analysis. There is a talk dedicated to this. I don't remember who talked about it this morning. There's a talk about static analysis today. Um, there are a few tools for this. Uh, is anyone using one of these? Roughly half of the people, that's cool. Right, there's Psalm, PHP Stun. Psalm is a very advanced tool, I think, um, very, very to the bleeding edge in terms of features. PHP Stun is the most widespread one. Then there's Fun, which is rarely used, mostly because it requires an extension, as far as I know, for AST parsing. And then there's PHP Inspection EA, which is a tool for PHP Storm. You install it, and hopefully it tells you that, well, what's wrong with your code? So these tools, they take your code, and all they do is tell you that you're wrong. Because you install them and you know they're gonna complain. Something's gonna be not okay. Now, the point of these tools is not just to tell you that you're wrong, of course, but the idea is that programs need to type check in order to work. If a program does not type check, that means that um, effectively the program is gonna crash. Now, effectively, it's simplified. Programs that type check are a superset of correct programs. Uh, you can have programs that you do not run through a type checker and then still run. That means that by luck, basically, the types match up. Or then, in certain situations, the type check out, uh, match up. I prefer using Psalm. This is really small. Jesus. Cool, that's better. Right, I prefer using Psalm. This is just my own preference. I'm, uh, I'm also sponsoring uh, PHP Stun. I sponsored some PHP Stun releases because they really matter to me, these tools. I sponsored EA inspection releases. I really like these tools. But right now, at this moment in time, I think Psalm is so ahead compared to all tools that it makes no sense to use the others. Maybe at some point they will catch up and they will be to the level that this tool is at. Now, what does this kind of tooling tell you? Relatively simple. Here's a piece of code that has a bunch of mistakes in it. If you already have experience in the language, you know exactly what's wrong with the code, but you don't need a person to tell you that. So you run the tool, and the tool will look at this foo function, and it will tell you, look, bar, why are you returning something? This function is void. What's going on here? And we'll look and say, look, this $s. You're never using it. Are you sure it's needed? And then it's gonna tell you, look, you declared void, but the function returns something. And down here it says, oh, look, this array, the first key has an integer in it, but you're calling the function that requires a string. And it will tell you, look, here's a parameter missing. Now these are all very simplistic. It goes much more in depth, and it can go really, really deep in detail. But effectively, the idea is that these things should not be told by a human. The other thing that happens is that once you start applying these tools, the way you write code changes massively. Um, you can either write in another language or you can write in PHP with these types uh, supported by tooling, and you get completely different code. One thing that I started doing a lot is this. I have a class price. Price has a public integer, no getters, no setters, and a constructor. 
Why do I need a getter when I can make things public? I can now make them public because the tool has this immutable annotation that I can put on things, and now I have a language feature that is enforced by tooling. Nobody can write to that property because it's kind of defended, protected by the tool. I can get a level of confidence of how far these tools go. So I like to call this feature type coverage. So this says Psalm was able to infer types for 99.78455% of the code. This is for Proxy Manager. I'm not sure if you've ever used it or looked at Proxy Manager, but Proxy Manager is a, is a, a library that uses eval. Okay, there's nothing worse than eval in terms of something may happen. And I still managed to get this level of confidence in the types of my, what my system is passing around. Now, if you have this as a very high number, you know that you can rely on the type checker to get things verified. If this number is very low, then you know that your system is very wobbly and many things may crash at runtime because apples get passed to potatoes. The idea is you get very fast feedback. You saw three seconds for running it, and it runs also on legacy systems. So you install this, even on the worst legacy system you can imagine, and you use a thing called the baseline. And the baseline is a big file where you hopefully never have to go in that much, and it usually has 50,000 lines of code of XML in it that say in which location which issue was found. Uh, very, very useful. So you can run it on an existing project right now. Now that we introduced static analysis, we can talk about testing. So I put static analysis before testing. This is important because, as I said, program needs to be type checked before it is correct. Now the program doing the correct thing is verified by test, but if it doesn't pass static analysis, it's already wrong up front. To do this, typical tools, PHP unit, we have PHP spec. I generally roll with the first two. Um, try not getting exotic. I know that people develop stuff like Autom and Coception and other things. Cool, but honestly, try to get tools that are more mainstream so that you can integrate with other tools that exist in the ecosystem. Obviously, this is polarizing, but this is the harsh truth. Otherwise, you have to go out and contribute to these other projects that you're interested in. Now, I roll with PHP unit, and that's sufficient. PHP unit, of course, by, by Sebastian Bergman and contributors. Um, so let me take an example of a test here. So we have a test of, well, a, a unit that we want to test. This is my function. My function receives a list of integers and then loops over the integers. And if one of the values is not an integer, it will throw an exception. So far, so good. Now, I take and write a test case for that unit. So I'm expecting that an invalid argument exception is thrown if my function is called with ABC. Is this test correct? This is a question. You can reply. Yeah. Is this test correct? Yes. This test makes no sense. Now, this test will run because PHP allows it, but we declared up here, uh, we want a list of integers. And here, we're passing a set of characters, all right? So effectively, this test will pass PHP unit, but it will not pass continuous integration because our static analysis will say, your argument invoke expects a list of integers, but you gave me an array that contains three keys for which each key contains a string. You know, each position contains a string. So the idea is that if you combine static analysis with testing, you can get rid of a load of very much useless code. So yeah. And uh, the system under test, by the way, will not pass static analysis because here we will have the type checker looking at it and say, look, you, you required a list of integers. So these numbers, well, this number is going to be an integer in the loop. 
And then you try to reconcile an integer with not integer. So this conditional will always be false. Okay, interesting there. So uh, this is cool because types are not a runtime problem. They happen to be analyzed before, right? So effectively you get a preview of what is wrong with your system up front. So back to this, correct programs are correct only after a already passed static analysis, well, type checks. Um, so I had a heated discussion with James Fitcom about this. Effectively, the idea was, but Marco, you cannot enforce static analysis on other projects, so we have to add these assertions to our library. And I was, or can I? So I wrote this tool, and you install it in your library. So if you're a library author, you require this tool and then consumers of your library will have static analysis run during composer install, and if static analysis finds an issue pertinent to your library in the consumer project, it will fail composer installation. So it's very annoying. Yeah, I know. That's how I roll. <laughs> now you can also verify, are we testing well enough? Okay, so let me write another unit here. Now here I used an interesting thing that came out in Psalm a couple of weeks ago. This is a list of integers. A list of integers means that we have a packed array. There are no gaps between the keys in the arrays, and the array is starting from index zero. Now I'm saying I want to filter any number greater than two is accepted by my filter, and then I obviously array value it. And if you want to test this, well, here's a simple test. I'm asserting that the count of elements when I filter 0, 3, 4, 5 is going to be 3. That's the count. Is this test well enough? Well, written and strict enough. Probably not. We know it because we have experience, but we can have tools tell us that. So you can run this thing called infection. Infection will run your test suite, and it is a mutation testing framework. So what it does is it goes through your code runs coverage, and then generates things called mutants. So it will find the covered code and change it slightly, and then rerun the tests. And if the test still passes, that means that your test is not sufficient to verify the invariance of your code. So here we have two escape mutants. If I go look at the logs, this is what infection did. It changed greater 2 to greater or equal 2. So we did not test the edge case of 2. OK? So our code works even if we change that. So our test is not sufficient for that. But it also removed array filter, right? Sorry, it removed array values around array filter, and it still run. Now what's interesting about this is, is this still valid from a type check perspective? This is not valid anymore. Because now if you filter, you have gaps in your array. And if you know, if you JSON serialize this, you get an object instead of an array. That's interesting. So if you're building things like API platform and stuff like that, or serializers in general, you know that this is going to be a problem. Now, effectively, these tools kind of clash with each other. Uh, but if we remove that array values, then the type checker will say, look, list int does not match array filter. Array filter produces an array, not a list. So I hope at some point we will have hooks in infection that runs static analysis on the mutated code. Now that we took all these interesting decisions about static analysis, architecture, documenting requirements, now we can talk about code style. Code style is not that important. It's interesting, but it's not that important. My suggestion is pick a base, pick some code style. I don't really care which one. I suggest PSR 12, just because it became kind of like the mainstream one. But effectively, you want to go deeper. There are strict code styles out there. I'm obviously going to toot my horn here. Uh, we wrote one called Doctrine Coding Standard. And what's interesting about Doctrine Coding Standard is that it denies a bunch of stuff in the language that really doesn't make sense. So for example, here, static A. Constants referenced through late static binding. This is a feature that nobody really needs. Do not override classes and define your new constant and then rely on static A as a way to define an interface. Write an interface. Don't use this. It prevents you double assignments. This is obviously or very 
likely a bug. You have two variables to which you assign a date time and you hope that it's gonna be separate date time instances, maybe because you're not very experienced, doesn't matter, but effectively this doesn't make sense. Write two different lines, two different assignments. If you want them to be the same thing, it's gonna be more explicit. It can also simplify some stuff, so here you have just a conditional, this is the typical, oh, Greg, you did it again kind of thing. Um, and effectively, you can just smash it into one line, fair enough. And it also removes some abominations of the language. So here we have the extracting compact function. Don't use these things. If you don't know what they do, keep it that way. That's okay. But you get a simple language. Simple language does less things. The problem with PHP is that it does too many things all at once. So you get this language where everything is possible, therefore it may fail in every possible way. And you get some performance out of it. But speaking of performance, you can automate that as well. I suggest you give PHP Bench a, a, a try. If you're writing a library and that library is not I.O. intensive but rather CPU and memory intensive, this is useful for you because it memory, uh, measures memory, time, and so on. I use it on my components to make sure that I'm not adding too much overhead to the language. So if I just write a complex thing that maybe may destroy your system in production from a performance perspective. You need a monitoring or APN solution. So if you want, there, I think there's the Blackfire people here. You can talk to them. I know also of Tideways, which is designed for PHP as well by Benjamin Everle, uh, who is from Doctrine as well. Sentry, which gives you very nice stack traces of what's happening in production, in your system, why is it crashing, and so nobody has to log in, install xdebug in a production system, and debug it there. Don't debug in production. Instana and Datadog are APM solutions that give you a full trace, from exception up here to database query down here. You know exactly which query was it, and at which time, and so on. So now you have it performant as well. Now make it stable. Test your API specification. If you have documentation about your project or an API specification, don't just have it somewhere. Test against it. Use it as part of your tests. So if you have an XSD, a JSON schema specification, Swagger, uh, Open API, whatever you use, use it as part of your tests. Use it during your tests because otherwise you're documenting something here and people are just going to be your test candidate. I had very good success with this open API PSR7 validator. The idea is that you plug it into an HTTP client, usually HTTP plug or something like that, and effectively it tests every request response pair against an open API specification that you write somewhere or that you generate somewhere. Prevent VC breaks. Now, this is one that where I'm really annoying, you know. Marco, can we just add a method to doctrine collections? No, we can't. It's not allowed. So I wrote a tool that tells you that. So this tool simply says no, like most of the tools today. But the idea is that you run this and it will figure out between two versions of the same library whether you introduce the BC break. So for example, in doctrine here, it says, oh look, we removed the do execute was removed. And down here we have a complicated one the parameter association mapping of new entity found through relationship changed from array to a non contravariant association metadata. That's complicated. Basically, it means we change the type declaration. That's what it means. Um, I have a full talk just about this. Now you have it stable. Now you can keep it updated. Do not update stuff without having these tests in place. You're going to break something. I love the Pandabot for that. If you're on GitHub, you can install the Pandabot. It spams my inbox every two days, and I get 40, 50 emails of stuff that I have to merge. And you get all these updates of stuff that you have to you know, keep, keep a look at. But now you got a precise idea of which dependency at which version broke your system. Security advisories. There is, by the way, the Symfony security checker component, which is equivalent to that. This is just because it's mine. Aha, this is my talk. Um, security advisories is a composer JSON that we generated, and we generate it regularly. 
and it just contains an exclusion map of things that you cannot install because there are security issues in it. You just add it to your dependencies of a project, not the library, please, and it acts kind of on just that. Um, I helped writing this Composer Require Checker. Composer Require Checker will make sure that all the dependencies that you use in your project, or at least it will try to get there, um, are part of your Composer JSON. The reason is simple. You require some component by Symfony, and in Symfony somebody makes some um, decoupling work that, does, that makes it so that the component is no longer required. At this point, you're going to have a problem because the next Composer update, that other component disappears, but you're still using it. And then you have a crash. There's the opposite, Composer unused. So one tries to raise the number of dependencies, the other one tries to remove dependencies that you do not use. So by I can have string. Right, so that was a lot of tools. Keep in mind, all these tools have to be considered against the time it takes for you to implement them. The good thing is that you don't have to write the automation. The automation was written for you. Um, but you have to always consider that these may fail and the people behind them are still humans. So they make mistakes. Uh, the good thing is effectively you have a good reference table by XKSD on when it is worth updating or introducing automation. I wrote a little revised table of the usual make it right, make it nice, and make it fast. And I added keep it stable and keep it updated. Keep it updated seems to be really difficult in this industry. You know, when everyone is running 5.3, you know. Um, and if you put it in a pipeline, in a CI pipeline, what you want to see is you want to have requirements, well, not in a CI pipeline, but you want to have them in the repository. Then you want a solid architecture on top of it, and that architecture needs to be owned by the team, not by some person that came and said, this is how we're gonna do it, all right? And then everyone hate the spirit, hates, hates the person. Um, then we add a layer of static analysis. The code can be proven to be wrong before even running it, okay? So if you get to that state, you already knew you have to, something to fix. You don't even need to run the code. That's a big advantage. Testing and mutation testing. Mutation testing is not 100% necessary, but try to enforce a minimum threshold of mutants that you allow versus do not allow so that you know that we are writing really bad tests or at least sufficiently good tests. Then you get stability through tools that verify that your API and your declarations in the types stay stable. Then you try to keep it updated. And then at the very end, if you have time, add code style. So as you can see, code style is very unimportant. Most people put it down here, you know, at the very bottom. This is where they put it. We're gonna add code style, but we don't have time for tests. Well done. Don't do that. So PHP is very far from the age where it was an interpreted language. You don't log into production, change the line of code, and reload the page. We don't do that. We write tests, and by the way, there's always this Docker build in between, so you always go for coffee anytime you want to you know, see something in production. So um, one of the strengths of the language is still this editing and seeing it immediately. But as soon as you start adding these steps, it becomes less evident. Uh, these steps are required, though. We can skip and we can make excuses, but we need to start owning our quality assurance process as developers. All right? So go to your boss, talk about it, try to get those people out of the QA department. <laughs> All right. I hope that was useful to most of you. And hopefully you saw some couple useful tools today. And if you have questions, uh, feel free to ping me on Twitter, either Rokramis or Rove Team. And thank you very much.
Sure, sure. Questions? If, if someone has some questions. Lock the doors. No. <laughs> Any questions? Any tool you want to say, I want to talk about this tool too. You didn't mention that tool. Mark, you're a horrible person. Hello. Uh, thanks a lot for this talk. Um, I have maybe a weird question, but what are your advices on how to convince the stakeholders and stuff in order to create a big testing and QA stack? Yeah, so you have to go back to um, very beginning. There's the paper. You can take the paper from 1996. So stakeholders, sometimes they are technical people, in which case you should charge more. Uh, but sometimes they understand money and that's it. If you put money there, look at that, 640 times. That's, that's really easy to, to understand for stakeholders. Um, I think that if you do things to a pragmatic enough level, so you're not doing, oh, we want a Kubernetes microservice, Lambda, this and that architecture with bells and whistles, but you rather say, we want something that works and we're sure that we're pushing something that works and you put it in those words and you tell them, look, every time it passes the coder, we're already losing time, that already helps. You can do that or you can simply not tell them and since this is pretty much going to guarantee that you're going to be faster, you can just implement it. The stakeholder shouldn't really need to know about the development process. They should really care about what is being developed feature by feature, week by week. So. This is more about convincing maybe a CTO or something like that, okay? About we need more CI machines and stuff like that. But get this paper, Software Defect Removal Efficiency. Any other question? Hello. Thank you for the talk. I have a question about PHP Bench. Um, let's say that I want to use it like now. I take one of my library, I run it. It gives me some metrics. But uh, do you have advice on how to use them? Because I don't, it's going to tell me I use this much random uh, memory, this much CPU. Uh, how can I know with, whether these numbers are good or bad? Yeah. So PHP Bench has a baseline benchmark feature where it kind of tells you this machine is this fast. So it will not be precise. My personal suggestion is take a machine where you're not doing something, right? Don't watch a movie while running PHP Bench. It may seem stupid, but that machine needs to be only doing that. And you run it commit by commit. And PHP Bench can generate reports in a a log format, XML, database, and stuff like that. You can dump those and then analyze where you're going. But um, over time, you know, running it on, uh, for example, Travis is a bit useless. I run them on Travis just to make sure the tests stay stable and they still run. But running it on Travis is a bit useless because you don't know what kind of virtual machine they're allocating and how much that virtual machine is being shared with other systems. So you may have hops, you know, where very fast at the beginning, then slow again, then fast, then slow, then, you know. Okay? Okay, S thank you. Uh, we know yep. more time. Feel free to ping me on uh, Twitter. I'm gonna be around for another hour or so, so thank you very much again.